Hi, my name is Magdalena Besanilla, and I'm from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And today I'm going to tell you a story about the intersection between two cytoskeletons and how they work together to help position cell division planes in plants. So positioning the cell division plane is very important because it ultimately dictates the shape of the cell. And so this is fundamentally an interest in the lab because my lab studies the molecular basis of cell shape. So this movie that I'm playing for you here is a movie of the cytoskeleton underneath the plasma membrane of a filamentous cell within the moss Fiscomatrella patens, which is the organism that my lab works on. And in red, you see microtubules, and in green, you see actin filaments. And what I want you to take away from this movie is just how beautifully complex and integrate this cytoskeleton is and how dynamic it is, and that it's constantly remodeling. So first, I need to tell you a little bit about how plant cells divide. They divide using the cytoskeleton, and um, their division is slightly different from animal cells. So in many plant cells, there's a microtubule structure called the preprophase band, which is a structure of microtubules right underneath the plasma membrane. And what that does is it essentially marks the cell cortex. And it says, this is where the new cell division plane should arrive. That's the preprophase band. And then, as mitosis proceeds and the nuclear envelope um, falls apart, the microtubules in the preprophase band disassemble, and they become part of the mitotic spindle. As you can see here, this is a spindle in metaphase, where the chromosomes are all aligned along the metaphase plate. Then anaphase occurs, and the chromosomes move to the two poles. And then those microtubules get repurposed again, and they get repurposed into a structure called the phragmoplast. So the phragmoplast is this beautiful structure based, um, made of microtubules. And what it does is it helps to move vesicles to the position in the middle of the phragmoplast. And those vesicles are full of cell wall material. So they fuse together, and they make this uh, uh, um, lipid bilayer, and then inside of it is in a new cell wall material. So what it's essentially doing is it's templating a new cell plate that's going to then separate the two daughter cells. This phragmoplast sets up in the middle between the two daughter nuclei, but then has to expand from the middle of the cell out to the cell cortex, to that site that had been defined by the preprophase band. There, that new membrane and cell wall material fuses with the mother cell wall, and cytokinesis is completed. So microtubules are absolutely essential for this process. If you were to get rid of the microtubule cytoskeleton, you would halt mitosis, you would halt uh, cytokinesis. But the other cytoskeleton in plant cells, the actin cytoskeleton, is also present. So the actin cytoskeleton is present in the preprophase band. It is also found in the phragmoplast. So the actin I'm um, showing you here is in blue, and the microtubules were in pink. Um, and the actin cytoskeleton is present throughout the cell cortex, so right underneath the plasma membrane throughout this entire process. And it's been a little bit challenging to figure out what the role of actin is during cell division. What is it doing in the preprophase band? What is it doing in the phragmoplast? Um, what is it doing at the cell cortex? And the main reason this has been challenging is because you can actually depolymerize the entire actin cytoskeleton and cell division kind of continues and still happens. And so it's not essential for cell division, but in every single plant species that's been looked at, actin is present. So it must be doing something. We just haven't figured out quite what it's doing. So my lab works on this moss, <clears throat> Fiscomatrella patens, and we're really interested in these beautiful filamentous cells and one of the things about the moss that is actually sort of attractive is that in these filamentous cells, they actually divide without having a preprophase band. So the apical cells, the subapical cells, they divide without having a preprophase band. So this is a image of microtubules in a living cell. And the blue dots would show you that in this particular image, which is a midplane section, of a nucleus before nuclear envelope breakdown, that's where you would see microtubular fluorescence if it were there. But it's not there, okay? So there is no preprophase band. 
now I'm going to play this movie and you're going to see nuclear envelope breakdown, formation of a mitotic spindle, and metaphase. And then it's just going to loop over and over again. So there is no preprophase band in these cells. So what that allows us to do is ask specifically, what is the role of actin in the phragmoplast? Right? We can get rid of the complication of the preprophase band because there is no preprophase band, and we can dissect what is the function of actin in the phragmoplast. And we got a window into this problem by analyzing a molecular motor that walks on actin filaments. So myosins are molecular motors that bind to and walk along actin filaments. And they're a very large, diverse family of molecules. Um, this is just a, a phylogenetic tree of myosins based on their motor domains uh, in, in eukaryotes. And you can see that there's at least 35 myosin classes when this particular paper was published. And what's really interesting and has always been very intriguing to me is the fact that plants only have two classes of myosins. They have a class 8 and then a class 11 myosin. And they don't have this huge, vast diversity that you can find in other organisms. Humans have many different classes of myosins, for example. So what are these myosins doing in plants and what is their role? And so Using the reverse genetics afforded to us by the powerful system, Fiscomatrella patents, we've actually analyzed the function of both plant, cl plant myosin classes. So um, myosin 11s um, are very similar to class 5 myosins from animals and fungi. And we think that they're important in vesicle transport and organelle transport. And we showed using RNA interference that they are essential for uh, polarized growth in moss. And in uh, other plants, in seed plants, they're important for cytoplasmic streaming um, and organelle movement. Myosin 8, which is uh, the store of today's show, um, are uh, less well studied and less well understood. So in seed plants, people have not figured out a function yet. Um, there have been limited localization studies. Um, using antibodies, they've shown that um, they can localize to um, the wall after cytokinesis, and also to um, channels that are um, found between plant cells called plasmodesmata. So we set out to analyze the function of class 8 myosins in plants in moss, and we used homologous recombination to generate knockouts. Um, so first I need to tell you that there are five genes that compose the myosin 8 family in moss, and they can be grouped into two groups based just on their sequence similarity. So the purple domain is the motor domain, and then the red domain is where the light chains bind, and the blue domains are predicted to be coiled coils, so these are likely to be dimeric myosins. So we essentially um, then also looked at the expression of these genes in different tissue types, and um, this is uh, shown here. So the green bars are the filamentous uh, tissues, the protonemata, and the purple bars are the expression in the um, leafy shoots or the gametophores. And what you can see is that with the ex exception of myosin 8D, um, most of them are expressed in this filamentous uh, uh, tissue uh, stage, the protonemata, and um, th there's not dramatic differences in their expression level. So we're going to focus on cell division events in these protonemal filaments because it's cell division in these protonemal filaments that are happening in the absence of a preprophase band. Okay, so we generated a panel of mutants using homologous recombination. We knocked out um, the myosin 8 genes. On the top panel, we have knockouts, single knockouts. We generated some double knockouts, one triple knockout, two quadruple knockouts, and then at the bottom there, you see regenerating plants of the quintuple knockout. So we actually knocked out all five class 8 myosins. So the first surprise is that you can live without class 8 myosins. But why hold on to five genes if you can live without them? So that's something that still bothers me at night. Um, but it is, you know, it is a fact that um, these myosins are not essential for viability. However, there are some differences. So these plants are plants that were regenerated from a single cell. And they're about five to six days old. And we're imaging them with a fluorescent microscope. And we're looking at the fluorescence in their wall because we've added a dye that binds to the wall. 
And so that allows us to measure the area of the plant because we measure the area of the fluorescence. And so wild type, we set to one, and we normalize all our data to wild type. So what you can see is that the single mutants are all a little bit smaller, and then subsequent knockouts eventually result in the quintuple knockout where you are a plant that's about 58% the size of wild type. So there is a growth defect. And if you look really carefully at these young plants, we notice that there's also a defect in positioning of the cell plate. So wild type plants that are five days old have what I'm calling transverse cell plates or an angle of zero. And um, the myosin-8 uh, mutant, as you can see from this histogram, has a large population of cells that have oblique cell plates. So instead of positioning the cell plate perfectly transversely to the, length, to the long axis of the cell, it, there, there's slop, there's some mistake here. So to get an idea of how this myosin is working, we wanted to generate a fusion of this molecule with a green fluorescent protein so we could analyze its localization. And so we decided to um, look at myosin 8A because, so the orange molecules are the ones that are all very similar to each other, and the blue ones are the ones that are similar to each other. So those are the two groups, the group A and the group B. And um, of group A, myosin 8A is the most highly expressed. So we thought, okay, we'll try that one, and we'll fuse it to three tandem GFP molecules, and we'll transform it back into the quintuple knockout. By transforming it back into the quintuple knockout, that allowed us the opportunity to see if this molecule was functional, because we could see if it rescued the phenotypes that we had observed in the quintuple knockout. So this uh, transgene largely rescues most of the phenotypes that we observed that I don't have time to talk to you about, but the one phenotype that's important for today is the cell plate positioning. And as you can see in this green histogram here, where we've taken the myosin-8 fused to the GFP and we've put it into the quintuple knockout, we see a shift of that distribution back to more wild type. So that tells us that this GFP uh, fusion protein is a functional protein, and we then analyzed its localization. So first I need to tell you that this is what wild type cells look like when we put them on our confocal microscope. So those are beautiful chloroplasts um, that autofluoresce in this particular channel. And so whenever you see chloroplasts in many of the images that I'm going to show you, that's just autofluorescence. Um, myosin-8 GFP plants look like this. So you can see that there's a very big difference between the wild type and the myosin-8 GFP in that the cytosol now lights up with the fluorescence, right? So the GFP, so those chloroplasts do not have any myosin-8 in them, but the cytoplasm does have a lot of myosin-8 GFP. And hopefully you can see that there are little particles, little intense particles, and some of those particles seem to be more enriched at the tip of the cell. So this is what sort of the global view looks like with, for example, a spinning disc confocal microscope. But we wanted to look right underneath the plasma membrane, and we wanted to analyze the localization of these molecules at the plasma membrane. So we use total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy to do that. And what I'm showing you here is an image from a turf microscope where you can see the myosin-8 GFP forms these beautiful little dynamic particles that are moving along the surface of the plasma membrane. And if then you want to ask, what about actin? You can then look at actin um, using a probe called LIFACT that binds to actin filaments. And what you can see is that many of those particles are moving along actin filaments. And this is what we would expect. This is a my myosin motor. It's supposed to walk on actin filaments. So this is, this is very gratifying to see. We actually measured the motility along these filaments, and we were able to find out how fast they moved, how long their trajectories were as well. So one day, my graduate student came to the lab and said, I got this image last night, and this looks like a really interesting structure. And I thought, oh my goodness, this looks like a mitotic spindle. And I thought, how is it that myosin-8 is localizing to a mitotic spindle? We know that actin's in the phragmoplast, but we hadn't really ever seen actin in a mitotic spindle. That's made of microtubules. So in order to really validate that this structure was a mitotic spindle, we needed to generate a line that had the fluorescent myosin also had fluorescent microtubules. So we generated a line that had both of these labeled with two different colors. And this is going to be a movie where I'm going to play um, myosin-8 in green and um, M-cherry tubulin in red in the merge. 
And this is right before nuclear envelope breakdown. So you can see those beautiful microtubules that are going right around the nucleus. Then the nucleus is going to break down and you're going to form um, the mitotic spindle. So as we play this movie, you can see that myosinate is clearly localizing two microtubules throughout the entire division process. Um, and as the nuclear envelope breaks down at the beginning of the movie, it immediately binds to the spindle. And then as it turns into a phragmoplast, which right, happens very quickly after that, you can see a very fine band of myosin-8 that localizes to the leading edge of the phragmoplast. So that was very exciting. So we wanted to ensure that actin really isn't in the mitotic spindle, because maybe it is in these cells and we hadn't looked carefully enough. So we looked at a line that had myosin-8 and actin. And so what you can see here is that myosin-8 localizes to the spindle, but it's when it turns into that very, very narrow band, that's when actin appears. Before then, really, actin is not accumulating. So actin is not in the mitotic spindle, but it seems to be appearing right when that spindle transitions into this phragmoplast that's so important for generating the new cell plate. So then we thought, okay, well, we have these tools, we have these drugs that we can get rid of the actin cytoskeleton, so what happens if we get rid of the actin cytoskeleton? So we treated cells with latrunculin, which is a drug that depolymerizes actin filaments, and then we looked at myosin, and we had M-cherry tubulin, so we could look at um, mitotic spindles and phragmoplasts. And what you can see is that myosin localizes just fine to the mitotic spindle, and it localizes just fine to the midzone of the phragmoplast during phragmoplast expansion. So this was very puzzling. We were a little concerned. So we did a little recap. Okay, myosins are actin-based motors. We know this, and they're walking along actin filaments in the cell cortex. But during cell division, they seem to be binding to microtubules, not actin necessarily. And they show up at the site of cell division before actin ever shows up. And it doesn't seem like their localization depends on actin during cell division. So this was a little bit puzzling. We were a little bit concerned. And so we asked the question, does myosin-8 actually work with actin during cell division? Or is it doing something entirely novel? Um, did we actually find a kinesin or something? Um, so we looked more carefully. So again, this is this movie that I've already shown you, where myosin-8 is localizing to the mitotic spindle there, and then as it turns into a phragmoplast, actin accumulates in the phragmoplast zone. So we thought maybe what's going on is that myosin-8 needs to get to the right area, and it gets to the right area by interacting with microtubules, but really its function is during cytokinesis, and that function works with actin. So to really address that, what we did was look very carefully at expanding phragmoplasts. So this is a wild-type cell labeled with GFP tubulin, and the membranes that are getting incorporating into that new cell plate are labeled with FM464, which is a lipophilic membrane dye. And so what you can see is this beautiful phragmoplast structure makes a very um, uh, linear sort of line that's very uniform, um, and you form a new cell plate. And then these are just examples, still images, of a beautiful, nice formed phragmoplast with membrane in the center in wild type cells. So then we thought, okay, well, let's look at what happens in the myosin-8 mutant. So in the myosin-8 mutant, again, there's your phragmoplast spindle, and then it turns into a phragmoplast at about now. And you can start to see membranes getting incorporated into that phragmoplast. And you can see that the phragmoplast is messier. It's not as uniform. And you can see that the membranes are not getting incorporated into a nice linear line. And over here, we have these stills, all right? And in the stills, you can see that the membrane is waves. And then you can see that you can form these sort of not very uh, normal looking cell plates. So it does look like in the myosin-8 mutant that phragmoplast expansion and the building of the new cell plate is aberrant. So if myosin-8 requires actin for its function during phragmoplast expansion, then we should be able to phenocopy this mutant phenotype by getting rid of actin. And so that's what we did. We looked at cells treated with latrunculin during this stage of phragmoplast expansion. And what we saw was that we got very um, similar results to knocking out the my five myosins. We see 
uh, disorganized phragmoplasts, and we see buckling of the membranes as the membranes incorporate. And in these still images, which are just other examples of this uh, uh, happening, you can see that the phragmoplasts are aberrant, and you can see that the planes of the membranes are not uniform. So that led us to think, okay, so this is probably a myosin, and it probably walks on actin filaments, and it's probably doing a job very specifically during um, cytokinesis and during cell expansion, uh, during uh, fragmoplast expansion. So this is a movie now where we're looking at myosin 8 and microtubules, and um, we're going to play it through once as the fragmoplast expands, and then I want you to focus where that circle is, because there are a lot of peripheral, of peripheral microtubules at the edge of this structure. And those peripheral microtubules, interestingly, all have myosin 8s on their ends. So it looks like these peripheral microtubules interact, have myosin 8 on the ends, and we know that in this structure, the ends of these microtubules are the plus ends of the microtubules. So it looks like myosin 8 is binding to the plus ends of these peripheral microtubules. And they very, very rapidly incorporate into the expanding phragmoplast as the phragmoplast expands. They also search the cell cortex, where you can also see an accumulation of myosin 8 at the cell cortex. So it looks like myosin 8 is helping to direct the expansion of this structure to the right place on the cell cortex. If we look at a very similar cell, but now a cell that is uh, treated with latrunculin, so there are no actin filaments, what we see is that now myosin 8 highly decorates those peripheral microtubules. They stay associated with the cell cortex for a very long period of time as those search and search and search, but there are no actin filaments around, so those myosin 8s just stay bound to the plus ends of the microtubules, and the whole structure actually can um, slip. So instead of being stuck in one place in the middle of the cell, the structure actually slips up and down and sometimes skews. So our hypothesis based on these images and these um, movies was that we think that actin is actually forming in the mid-zone, the edge of the phragmoplast. So we work on molecules that polymerize actin filaments, and we thought, well, let's look at them during cell division and see where they are. And so we have a line that has a functional fusion of uh, formin 2A, which polymerizes actin filaments, and um, fused to GFP, and a line that has m cherry tubulin. And as this, this, this is a spindle that's in um, metaphase, and it's going to go into anaphase when I play the movie. So you can see anaphase from those shadows moving apart from each other. And then you can see formin 2A accumulate beautifully in the mid-zone of the phragmoplast as the phragmoplast expands out to the mother cell cortex. So formin is exactly where it needs to be if actin filaments are being polymerized off of this expanding structure. So then we needed to just bite the bullet and look at actin and microtubules at the same time. Actin is very challenging to image because it's very, very dynamic. And so um, we were fortunate enough to be able to uh, get a good images of this um, using a fairly fast uh, microscope. And what you can see here, Actin is in green, microtubules are in red in this merge image. And the circle is just pointing to that area where those peripheral microtubules are, and they're embedded in a meshwork of actin filaments. And that meshwork of actin filaments is connected to the cell cortex. So the microtubules are being templated by this meshwork to incorporate in, along a specific plane in the middle of the cell, allowing for the expansion to occur, and so that that structure doesn't slip up or down and doesn't tweak. And so it's a, and remember those peripheral microtubules have myosin 8 on their plus ends. So they are then incorporating and in, uh, interacting with the actin filaments to then make this structure incorporate the right way. So this led us to a model where we think myosin 8 is binding to the mitotic spindle essentially as a way to get to the right place and be there at the right time. And then um, in anaphase, myosin 8 concentrates at the cell cortex. It also concentrates in the middle of the spindle and also in the poles. We don't understand the polar concentration. We haven't figured that out yet, but we understand what's going on with this um, um, in the middle here. As this turns into a phragmoplast, then um, actin gets polymerized off of the middle there 
towards the cell cortex where myosin A can hold on to it and that essentially makes a network that then the microtubules will connect to and then incorporate along this plane, allowing for cell division to occur along in, in the correct plane and divide the cell properly. So that's what's happening in division in an apical cell in these um, proteinemal filaments. So we were wondering about subapical cells because these subapical cells, as you can see here in these division events, are asymmetric events where you actually have to move the nucleus to the division site, and then division occurs at the division site. So we know that there are no preprophase bands there, but what does myosinate look like when you have this branching event where you have to have this large nuclear migration? One of the things that we noticed right away in our mutant analysis is that the myosinate knockout, so this is the quintuple knockout, has dramatic defects in cell plate positioning um, right at branch sites. So this is an image with calcofluor fluorescence. Calcofluor binds very specifically to new cell plates. And so you can see that some of these cell plates are incomplete, um, and some of them are uh, very aberrant in their um, positioning. So it seems as if the phenotype actually is uh, enhanced at branch sites. So myosin-8 at branch sites localizes to the emerging branch neck. And it localizes to the emerging branch neck before mitosis even begins. And as this movie will loop, you'll see that as the uh, cell goes into mitosis and then there's a phragmoplast, you actually have two rings of myosin-8 that are concentric. One that was very static on the cell cortex, and then one that's on the phragmoplast that expands out and reaches that uh, cortical population. So this actually looks like a preprophase band, except it doesn't have any microtubules. It just has myosin-8. So myosin-8 is defining the cortical region that the phragmoplast needs to expand to. Okay? And this requires actin. Because if we treat cells um, with latrunculin, you will see that um, the myosin-8 doesn't have any actin filaments to interact with, and you see buckling of the cell, of the cell plate as it's uh, expanding. Um, and this is the phenotype that we see so clearly in the myosin-8 knockout. Okay, so that's what's happening in moss, where there is no preprophase band. But we wanted to ask the question, well, what happens in a plant cell that does have a preprophase band. Where would myosin-8 localize in that cell? And the other thing is that we needed to redraw what the actin looks like in an expanding phragmoplast. So the actin actually is coming out of the center of the phragmoplast, and it's not necessarily collinear with the phragmoplast, which is what's in the textbooks. OK, so in order to analyze myosin-8 localization in a cell that has a preprophase band, we decided to turn to tobacco BY2 suspension culture cells because this is a plant cell culture line that has been used to analyze cell division for years and years inside kinesis as well. And it's a beautiful cell type that uh, is very large and very easy to image. So we actually decided to put the moss myosinate into these cells and see how the moss myosinate localizes. And to our delight, we got images that looked like this. So this is a cell that's about to undergo mitosis, you can actually see a halo of the nuclear envelope, and you can see a band of myosin-8 right underneath the cell cortex. This is exactly what the preprophase band looks like. So myosin-8 from moss is binding to the preprophase band of tobacco cells. And what happens in cytokinesis? So in the cortical division site, you can see it at the cortical division site in a maximum projection image. Um, but if you look at the midplane of that same cell, what you see is the phragmoplast. Um, I'm going to point out here in circles where the cortical division site is right at the cell cortex. But then you also see myosin-8 accumulating in the midzone of the phragmoplast. So myosin-8 is both at the cortical division site and in the phragmoplast midzone. So, um, if we look at a cell that's undergoing division and we label myosin-8 and membranes, we can see here that um, the myosin-8 is in green and the membranes uh, labeled by FM464 are in red. What you can see is that the phragmoplast expands out to a site, and that arrow is pointing to the myosin-8 accumulation at the cortical division site. 
So you have myosin-8 both in the phragmoplast midzone and at the cortical division site, providing a mechanistic link between the expansion of the phragmoplast and the site where it needs to join the mother cell wall. So what I've told you today is that during cell division, myosin-8 marks the future site of division in these branching cells. In the apical cells that divide symmetrically, that mark happens around anaphase. But in these cells where you have to actually move the nucleus to the site of division, it happens before mitosis begins. And then myosin-8 localizes to the mitotic spindle and to the phragmoplast, and you have this internal uh, ring of myosin-8 on the expanding phragmoplast that grows out and reaches the uh, cortical population. So myosin-8, together with actin, provide this mechanistic and spatial link between the phragmoplast and the cortical division site. So with that, I want to thank you for watching, and I want to thank Shujan Wu, very talented graduate student and postdoc who has been working on this project and has just a wonderful imager. Thank you.